I've been wanting to make this video for quite some time. I did a smaller breakdown about a year ago. Since then, there has been so much that has changed on this rig that I primarily use for corporate work and documentary work. And every piece that I buy is an intentional purchase to maximize efficiency. That's the whole goal with me, is I want the fastest rig possible. Even the way it's designed to sit, uh, the bag that I purchased, I can drop this in and pull it out. I used to have a DSLR and mir mirrorless setup and I was always tightening things and attaching accessories and I was losing time on set. And now that I just full hearted went into, I will have a bigger setup that will be the ACAM. I've been able to maximize a lot of things. So let's start. This is what it looks like, fully built. It will return to this state at the end, but let's take everything apart. So this is how I pulled it out of the box. You get the brain and the top handle. A lot of people are not a fan of the top handle. I think it has the perfect flow and distribution for balance. Even has grooves for the fingers with a rubberized bottom. Uh, of course, it would be nice to have at least one audio input on the body, but it doesn't exist. So. As it stands, uh, this is a great style and that's what we're gonna be working with today. So first thing, I had always been on APS-C or Micro Four Thirds sensors, so it was really nice upgrade to step into the full frame world. So I'll be using my favorite lens, the 24 to 70 GM Mark II. As I've gotten into more documentary work, I have seen the value of this aperture ring. I didn't think it would make that much of a difference. It is fantastic when you're shooting on the shoulder and the shot is live and you want to adjust your f-stop and not your variable ND, which is also fantastic for run and gun dock work. Um, it's just a bell, a whistle that will make your life easier and, and you will see throughout all of the gear here, this is all designed to make my life easier. So camera going, just a normal 501 base plate on the bottom and let's begin. So let's start with uh, power and I decided to get the Tilta V-mount adapter pros and cons to this. Pro is it feels like a very a unified system. The, the batteries feel uh, like very in line with how this camera is designed to see, designed to be. If you have seen older Sony cameras like the F55, it's just one solid rectangle and I wanted to kind of emulate that. So um, also even down to the hardware, I've tried to make almost every bolt on here be accessible with one size. There's a couple that are different, but just another thing, let's make my life easier. So um, before we throw this on, even though I just did, um, we're gonna also talk about the power distribution for the monitor, because in case you didn't notice before, uh, there is no Sony OEM monitor on here. And the number one question I get asked is, do you miss touch focus? At times, it would be nice to have. The majority of the time, no, it makes no difference. Um, most of the time I'm using autofocus, it's in face or eye only, or face and eye priority. And when it's like that, I just use the selector on the hand grip, the toggle, to choose between which face I want it to lock onto. So I do not miss the um, OEM monitor. Okay, so let's throw in the cables that are packed into here. Uh, the cables, you will see it is a theme. Almost every cable here is right angle and that is 100% by design to eliminate my clumsiness of bouncing it or uh, you know brushing it up against something, pulling something. It eliminates the amount of reach that this has to grab onto something. So I am a huge fan of 90 degree cables. This cable that powers the monitor is from Small HD, and you can get this for about $49 as a bunch of different uh, knockoffs, but the real one is $120. And there's some parts that I place uh, financial emphasis on, and power distribution is one of them. Uh, I am going from a third party 
power supply into a third party monitor. So at least the cable, or sorry, the, uh, the cable that distributes power is designed to work with the end device, the monitor. And that is a big deal. Um, you do not want, I do not want electrical issues out there. So let's tidy up some of these cables. Uh, the tilt -a plate has a really nice area that you can kind of roll them up, coil them up and stick them inside, which I take advantage of. I like my rigs as tight as possible. We're gonna put the D-tap for the monitor into the top here. Reason I put it on this side and not this side is because the media door will prevent uh, access, or the DTAP will prevent access to the media door. So, um, cons now about the Tilta is it is extremely cramped to access the I.O. Um, for me, I don't have a lot of I.O. changes or adjustments between rigs. This monitor pretty much lives on here and um, that's how I've been able to keep it. But when I do go on jobs where they have an audio guy and he needs to access the time code port, it's a little bit of a struggle to get in and out. Everything is so tight in here. Um, another con, you cannot put a Sony OEM battery in the back. The only power you have is from the V-mount and that can pose a problem if you want to hot swap. So. You cannot hot swap with this. They have a Mark II of this, and uh, it's a little bit bulkier, not quite my cup of tea. So it attaches via the hot pins in the battery slot, and then you have an additional screw to attach it to the Tilta top plate. Uh, a couple people have gone without the top plate, and they've regretted it because when you are taking these bricks and throwing them on here, takes a little bit of force, you are translating that force to the battery pins and you are potentially bending them out until they break and then you would need to service the camera when you could have just bought this very, very lightweight top plate and that way it has another point of contact so you can feel a little bit more secure when you are strongly putting in the battery. Okay. This is a very recent addition, loom cabling. I didn't know it was a thing until I started seeing um, more established DPs post pictures of their rigs. And I said, what is that? I need cable management. And it's extremely inexpensive. I think it was $7. Um, I didn't say it before, but I did put a title. All the links to every single piece will be in the description. My Amazon affiliate links I get. Uh, a percentage off of it. So if you need it, it's in the description. I've done all the hard work for you. If you want to copy this rig, be my guest. So uh, in the vein of ca cable management, we are using two types of uh, cable aggregators. So one is Sprig, uh, has this little, I don't know if you can see that, has a little, um, cable holder and then there is another one somewhere here which I just purchased and here we go this is from small rig and it is a cable clamp so this clamp allows um, a little bit different functionality this kind of holds it until you kind of pull on it it can pull out just via tension this one has more of a clasp that will keep it tight so I've used different um, cable managers in different parts of the rig depending on where they are and where tension is. So this one is here. It keeps the battery cable and SDI cable very in line with the camera. And then we're going to start building probably the thing I'm most proud about with this rig and that is the monitor mounting solution. So let's start here and throw this in. This is from Nicey Rig, just a small little cheese plate. And it's gonna go right here. We have uh, two different screw lengths. One is smaller just to go through the tilt-a-plate. 
The other is longer because it's gonna go through the tilt -a plate and screw into the Sony FX6 body. Uh, that is by design just to have uh, more security. Instead of pulling on the plate, it'll pull through the plate additionally into the body. So I've had you know mixed matches of screws from all different accessories and this is what I've found to, to really keep the, the rig functional and strong. I, I just don't want things bending, pulling, loosening. That is the opposite of what I want. So we go from this little cheese rail to this 15 mil rod holder. Um, I'm gonna assume, I don't even see a name on it, so whatever it says in the description is what it is. But I, I would assume it's a small rig or nicey rig. Now, part of the effort with mounting these multiple uh, accessories is I need to push my monitor out further away from my eye. If you guys have seen shoulder rigs on YouTube, you'll see a ton of people who will have the rig, one, the shoulder pad won't even be on their shoulder. It's very frustrating to look at that when they're trying to tell you how to build a shoulder rig. So instead of having it here, the shoulder pad is right about here and it's not being used at all. And then when they do put it here, the screen is right about there, completely unusable. So by putting these plates here and accessories, I'm pushing out where the monitor will be. Another sprig tie, keeping the cabling in line and then we're gonna go into um, this piece. So I found this piece, um, I believe from Nicey Rig, and it was 20 bucks. If you get this exact same NATO rail to 15 mil rod holder, it's $120 from Wooden Camera. So that is not part of my, uh, that, that's where I'm gonna save the cost because I believe that you can on this. So we're gonna put a 15 mil rod that I cut off, just made about an inch throw it right in here and uh, tighten down. So you have two mechanisms, one to tighten down the rod holder on this piece and then the uh, NATO rail has its own tightener. So it's very nice to have double security. So now we go from here into the small rig clamp. I really like that. And then um, this is uh, a small HD 502 Bright. It's a little bit older, but if you look on uh, kind of more established or industry productions, you will see the 502 and the 702 very, very frequently um, because it works. It's a very low pa power draw, I think six amps, and that makes my batteries last longer. The FX6 has a low power draw, that makes my batteries longer. And uh, a thousand nits, it's great for outside. and very importantly, the ports are on the back. I had a Atomos Ninja before and I absolutely hated having the HDMI right here. Again, just able to brush again things, brush against things, bend pins, uh, just, it, it just not a smart design. I used a Ninja for forever. It's great for the value. A Shinobi is even better if you're not externally recording, but once I found this monitor, I knew it was pricey, like about $800 used, but I knew it would fit my needs and that's most important. So this is the part that probably has solved the most problems on my rig. So let's throw it on here first. It's just a monitor mount from wooden camera. So it goes one side NATO and then the other side is just a screw that goes directly into the monitor. So it's not revolutionary, but this is a premium product. I've tried countless of other uh, monitor mounts, ones that either they don't have anti-twist, you know, locating, area locating pins, they will adjust great, and then when you let go, they fall, or they work for a few minutes, and then they, they fall down, or you have to uh, undo a tension knob to articulate, and when you are in a live situation, I don't want that time to go by, you know? I have to let go of the rig, 
to adjust the monitor, um, or worse, you need two hands to do it. And those were all problems that I, I wanted to avoid. So with this one, um, it's, it's expensive, but this is one of the parts that I would, will put money into because it makes a huge difference. So just this little piece is $250. Um, I had it delivered here. The FedEx guy took a picture and I got the email immediately and went outside and it was gone. So he stole it. FedEx denied my claim because he took a picture. But I had to buy another one. So I spent $500 on this thing and uh, I'm very glad I did because it is fantastic. So you, with one hand, you can articulate the monitor. You can, uh, with like fluidness, and I don't have to undo, adjust, tighten. That was, a, that was a big problem. And my one thing I wish I could change is I wish I could swing this in. And, and there are a ton of mon uh, monitor mounts that do tilt and swivel. And if you mount it laterally, it will do that function. The only problem is over time, they begin to sag, they lose their tension. And I've had this for maybe a year and it has never been an issue. Um, I saw it in Luke Forsythe's video when he was breaking down his rig. I asked him, I just fingers crossed, please tell me what this part is. It's the one I've been searching for and I've had it ever since and I highly, highly recommend it. So now with this, we have the monitor pushed out away from my eye. I have a very comfortable distance and that is solving that issue. Alternatively, if I wanted to uh, bring it back, let's say I didn't need all this distance, you can. You can swing it all the way over and you can readjust it and then tighten it back down, which is great if you're doing seated work for, I don't know, sports games or something. Uh, it has that articulation ability. So that was a huge, a huge hurdle to get over. Um, you can see it's kind of leaning to the left now and let's balance it out and use the included hand grip. Um, this is one of the things that I wanted when I sold my C70 last is I wanted a hand grip that could articulate because when I had the C70 and a sim similar build out as this, your hands locked like that and it is extremely uncomfortable when you're trying to go up, go high, just hold and a shoulder position. So I love the quick release function. I can go like this for chest uh, height shooting. I can go like this if I need to throw it up here. Speed, efficiency, that is, that is a beautiful thing. I wish all camera manufacturers did that. I think the C70, if they made a Mark II, if you look at the older XC10s, XC15s, they do have an adjustable hand grip on a small box size camera. Uh, it's just a bad camera. The C70 would benefit greatly. I know so many op operators who would love just a little bit of tilt function um, to make it more user friendly. Okay, so moving on, um, this is a little piece that is just, actually this piece came with the wooden camera bit. Um, it's specifically to attach a, a certain type of EVF and uh, I didn't have that, so I was trying to find a better storage way, um, or a better way to store the camera, um, just so that I didn't have to have this monitor sticking out when I was transporting the camera. And so what I did is I just screwed a little 15 mil, uh, or sorry, I screwed a small, short, low prof profile NATO rail to the bottom of this, and what that allows me to do is I can say, we're done here. Okay, I don't want this sticking out. So we're just gonna undo it. We're going to swing it this way and then load it here, tighten it down. So this allows for a little bit friendlier transport. There's um, not as much width and the screen is in towards the camera, keeping it safe. So I really do like that when I need to transport it. Uh, takes a couple seconds to do, but way better than unscrewing anything or reconnecting cables. Everything gets to stay on the monitor. So we're making it, we're getting closer and closer. Um, let's move into 
audio. So I like to use earbuds. I know they're probably not the first choice of many, but I'm not an audio tech. I just need to make sure levels are good and uh, there's no interference, there's no hits, no scratchiness. So um, a problem I ran into is I would throw these in and then I would need to walk away from the camera and I would drop them and they'd be hanging down by the tripod or I would kind of throw it here and have some spaghetti hanging off and I didn't like that. So uh, we just got the small rig clamp that I mentioned and affixed it here. And that way when I am moment, uh, temporarily done with audio and I just need to clean up the cable but I don't need to take it off, I just go like this, coil it around my hand and I have a clasp that I can just pull and hold the headphones. Now, what this allows me to do is shave off another 10 seconds from going into my audio bag and plugging in the headphones and then putting them on. And if you keep saving 10 seconds after 10 seconds after 10 seconds, you are in a fantastic position. Um, you're able to have the camera on faster. You're able to start the shoot faster. You're able to talk to the client faster. This isn't, this stuff is not what I should be slowing down production with. So I get to keep the headphones on here at all times. If I ever need to monitor audio, just pull it off or throw it back in. And right now we're not much heavier than the, the base FX6 rig besides these bricks. Okay, so when we do run a lavalier, the one that I'm wearing right now, um, we have a right angle that is going into the lav receiver 3.5 mil, and then we have a right angle uh, that is going into the XLR modules. So um, let's just put it in channel one. And then I like having uh, an onboard shotgun mic. A lot of times if I'm doing interviews, it goes overhead on a boom, that's okay when I'm doing dock work and a lot of times the sound guy will feed me his mix and then I will just have a safety channel of onboard audio. So, of course, right angle cables. Also, exactly the size that I want. So let's throw this one in and I've bought the wrong, the wrong one before where I got two female sides so make sure you check because I have both of them listed in my in my description and we're gonna just kind of coil this in because we are putting this DD S mic 2s the last s of that means short they have a longer version uh, I don't want the longer version it takes up too much space this gets it done and I think I had to pay I don't know, 15 bucks or something because Sony decided to make a microphone holder that would only fit their proprietary mics. So we got around that just with a rubber spacer. I know a lot of people who have gotten around that by just clamping onto the foam. That works especially well if you have the longer DD mic, but I wanted the short one. So we're gonna go right here. And also a trick that I had was I will take the, the XLR cable and I will actually run it through this, there's a little gap in that rubber holder. And we will plug in somewhere. I know it's here, there we go. And then this wire will clamp inside and keep it nice and tidy. Then this, if I'm not using a lavalier receiver I still keep it on here. It's another 10 seconds. So this stays right here and just folds into itself with its own stretchy tension. And now I don't have to go searching for that cable. It's always on here. Speaking about uh, microphone packs, I have the older Rode Wireless um, Filmmaker kit. It's much older. It's much bigger than the road goes or the road pros and I would love from an ergonomic standpoint to have the road pros always on here 
that would be great. Another 10 seconds. Uh, but I'm still leaning towards the Sony UWPs uh, because that would allow me two subjects to be loved and I can retain this onboard mic in channel two. And actually uh, that would free up another XLR. So it's just a lot more audio options. Okay, this is the rig that I am using the majority of the time. And it's just the, the handle, power, and monitor. And this is absolutely fantastic. So feel free to steal all of these ideas. Um, I, I've had so many iterations of this rig of what works best, or I'll try a small accessory out, it won't work, I'll switch it out to something else. And this has all the final pieces. Now there is one more iteration that I use for when I am doing shoulder work for documentaries, and that is with the newest edition that I got this week. So keep in mind, it hasn't had a ton of testing. Um, I just made a video about it. If you wanna see kind of a more in-depth view of these pieces, but I wanted to be able to throw this onto a VCT plate. And I also wanted to keep the Manfrotto 501 plate when I throw it into the VCT. And then I also wanted to be able to pull that out, let go of the shoulder pad and the VCT base plate, and then throw this onto my tripod, which accepts 501 plates. And I could not find a combination of products or a solution to allow me to do that that was at the price range that I wanted. So I just gave up on it and I said, I have my shoulder pad and whenever I want to go to sticks, I have to unscrew things and throw it in there. But then there became some more situations where I've been having requests for uh, teleprompters needing a dual rail system. So I had to revisit it and I said, if I can find something that allows for that 501 plate uh, acceptability, uh, let's go for it. And wouldn't you know, I found it for a much cheaper price. Most of the other Zacuto uh, shoulder plates and uh, shoulder mounted uh, VCT plates um, are fantastic, industry accepted, and uh, they're just expensive. So I didn't wanna spend that much. I found this eight sin plate and it is, uh, accepts dual rods. I have one in here, I'll talk about that later. It has rosettes on here and it has a not extremely comfortable pad, but it'll, it'll kind of do. So when I throw that in, I can take the 501 plate that it came with, slide it in, and tighten down with a thumb screw, which is nice. So I only have the left rail in. Uh, most operators have both rails in. I would say all operators do. Uh, but what this allows me to do is change the balance so if I take my Shape FX6 side grip relocation arm uh, and attach it to the left side, uh, which by the way, this was uh, $400 and I believe I got it on sale on Independence Day sale and then the Aitzen shoulder pad uh, was just on a Black Friday sale. so. This one was 400, I think it dropped down to like 330. And then this one was 400 and dropped down to 300. So just trying to save money. I mean, if they're gonna give it to you for cheaper, then I will take it for cheaper. So we take uh, the relocation arm, throw it on the left side, unplug this, take the side grip off, throw it on here. And this will all make sense in a second. Let's connect our cables and go back into the camera, which I love that you can just extend this. Uh, I wish like the FX, FS7 and FX9, I wish there was a rosette on the body. Does it exist? So when you are shoulder operating, um, this is generally a position you wanna be in. Usually if you have two, two handles, it would be like this. But uh, by having it on the left rail and not on the right rail, I'm able to uh, reduce about three inches of my hand holding like this. 
and that makes a big difference over a full day of shooting. I believe it's called your rotator cuff. Uh, it's just extra strain on that. Whereas if I keep my hand under the camera, under the weight, uh, it's a lot easier. It's a lot less stress on joints and uh, you wanna be as comfortable as possible. So that is my fix and I kinda use this rail. <laughs> so this was an eight inch rail and I probably sawed off an inch of it and that's what I used for the, the 15 mil rail up here. And then um, I just put it in here and that way when I'm not operating the barrel of the lens, I can still hold this and keep the camera steady. So because I'm not using an EVF, I don't have a third point of contact. So having this here, this here in a comfortable position under the weight of the camera, not off to the side, and having my left hand here, a lot of times I will put kind of my palm here and then I will just manipulate the focus ring while still having my hand on the rod. And I'm trying to give the editor and the director a reason to hire me back. So the more stable I can make my footage, the better. Now, uh, I love YouTube because whenever I post something, people give their opinion. And sometimes it's a really, really valuable opinion. So recently when I did this uh, eight sin shoulder pad video, uh, a guy said uh, something that I just alluded to. He said, if you're gonna go, you would think you would want your hand down here, but he said that's more of a cinema, cinema style of operation, and it's meant to be paired with another hand down here, two arms to be able to move the camera. When you're doing more uh, run and gun dock work, he said you can actually, uh, you, you guys can look in the comments uh, to see his entire break, breakdown. It was very lengthy. It, he was saying that if you have the hand grip up closer to the lens, I think it allows you to relax the shoulder, basically keeping your arm like this. It's kind of like pulling on here, rather than here where you kind of have to use your shoulder to elevate, something along those lines. So I tried it and um, I might switch to that system where I will just get, I will get rid of the uh, shape arm, but effectively it would be like having, having the grip right around here. And I'll try it on one of my shoot days, but um, I love learning from people who have already had years of mistakes. That's a lot of what I'm doing on my channel is I'm just sharing what works and what doesn't work for me and um, quick pitch for the consultation calls. If you wanna have a one-on-one -on -one with me, you can. It's 125 an hour and I get to talk about everything that's worked for me, everything that has not worked for me or worked or not worked for my peers and just load that info on you so you don't have to uh, go through the same mistakes and a lot of people find value in being able to ask questions to someone who's just working in the industry. There are a ton of people at a much higher level, but I am making a living from freelance filmmaking, freelance videography, whatever you wanna call it. And I love having these conversations with people uh, who just need more info. You know, how do I invoice? Where do I invoice? Uh, when did you start implementing uh, gear insurance? Just a, a laundry list of questions. I'm happy to go in it with you. So um, email me if you want to get on the books. And I also have a, a new idea coming for kind of like a digital cohort of peers. That, that'll be coming later. Um, but this is the final rig of what I would need if I'm doing documentary work or the previous one was for corporate work. And <laughs> it's done. I know it's not completely done. There's definitely things that I will change, but I am so satisfied with the efficiency of this rig. And um, that is something that I, it is hard for me to watch when I see um, less experienced people on set and they are giving so much of their mental capacity and their time to twisting this and tightening that and where's the where's the allen key for this thing and then hold on one second i need to find my base plate because it doesn't live on here and it's just uh it's like i said i want to give them reasons to hire me back and if i'm always standing there saying no no i'm ready 
where, where, where are we going? They just know that I am not a kink in the workflow. I am something that makes their life easier. By having me on set, I don't have to worry about him. He's already ready to go and efficiency is the name of my game and why there are so many specific odds and ends on here. So I did this whole thing on my plastic Olympia cart and uh, this is a, another thing that I've been trying to figure out how can I um, transport all my gear and be able to be fast. Uh, the situation I have right now is not great. I put on new casters, they wobble, uh, the original casters are too loud, it makes too much of a fuss when I'm going through corporate buildings. So I'm working with a company right now. Um, very, very close on, I've been talking with their CEO, trying to get a, a alternative to this, an alternative to innovative, uh, because it's just so expensive, uh, but something that will work for me. Big, chunky, fat tires, um, a strong, durable chassis, and most importantly, that I can set up quickly and fit into my tiny, tiny little sports car. I have a Subaru BRZ, and um, contrary to what a lot of people have been suggesting, I will not be getting a production van. It's not my style. Uh, so I need to figure out a cart solution that can work in, in a tiny little fold-down trunk. Uh, so that will be coming soon, um, but for now, uh, thank you guys for watching this video. It's extremely long. If anybody asks me in the future what part do I have, I will send them directly here. And like I said, please purchase using the Amazon links. And we did it all in one sunset. So super long video, and I'll see you guys in the next one.